Hello and welcome to this Royal Television Society Breaking Into Media event with ITV News at 10 presenter Julie Etchingham. Uh, I'm Mike Baker, a journalism programme leader here at Plymouth Marjon University and I'll be hosting today's session. Uh, we only have an hour, breaking news notwithstanding, um, so I'm going to crack on. Um, so welcome to Julie. Uh, many of you will recognise as the presenter of ITV's flagship News at 10 show and she's doing so tonight as it happens. Um, she also presents the Current Affairs programme tonight, having done so since 2010, since taking over from Sir Trevor MacDonald. I'm sure she'll tell us more details on how she got her big break in journalism in a moment, uh, but as with some other high profile broadcasters we could mention, a lot does seem to revolve around an early career move to BBC Radio Leicester. But <laughs> more of that, I'm sure, in a moment. Anyway, after that came stints at Midlands Today, BBC Breakfast News, News Round, and Holiday before Julie joined Sky in 2002. In 2008, she joined Sir Trevor behind the news at 10 desk when there were still two presenters. And uh, has since covered royal weddings and funerals, uh, Diamond Jubilee, general election leaders debates, and lots of other stuff. In 2010, she was named Presenter of the Year at the Royal Television Society Journalism Awards, the first woman to win, and she won it again in 2016. She also presents the Ask a Woman podcast, and most recently was at the COP26 conference in Glasgow. So, thank you for joining us today, Julie. Another busy news day, it seems. Yes, it is. Yeah, I don't know the, how much you can see behind me, but um, just behind that door is the little corridor into our newsroom. So there may be some noises off, I suspect. But yes, I'm doing <laughs> tonight. Um, and uh, just keeping an eye on the Prime Minister appearing before the Select Committee on the other screen in my little office. So um, yeah, just a usual day, really. Never a dull moment. In the news, <laughs> right? um, so first, how we're going to do this today, hopefully, is um, we'll kick off with me asking some questions, um, some general ones to Julie. But what we really want is for the questions to come in from our audience, so in the chat. So Tom, who will join us shortly as a third year sports journalism student here at Marjon, um, is gonna keep an eye on those. So it might seem like the obvious thing to start with, um, but just to kick off, tell us how, how it all started for you. I know there was something slightly before BBC Radio Leicester, but um, you know, and then and some of the decisions you took along the way to get you where you are now, really. Um, well, thank you very much for, for asking me today um, and thank you for the question. Uh, yes, it feels like I have, to, I have to rewind quite a lot of years now really to where it all started. But um, mine started really in childhood because I kept a diary from the age of six and um, the older I got, the more little news cuttings I was keeping in my diary. I sort of used to, you know, I just got interested in it from quite a young age and uh, I grew up in Leicester. Um, so it used to be little cuttings from the Leicester Mercury and other bits and pieces. Um, and uh, when I was about 13, my mother, who was a teacher, said, oh, do you think you might like to be a journalist? And I can even remember where we were when she asked me. And uh, I, it was like a little light bulb moment. I thought, gosh, that's it. That's it. Yeah, I'll do that then. <laughs> so I sort of um, sort of really wanted to do it from quite a young age. Um, and uh, when I was a little bit older, um, my, my mother sort of said to me, well, if you're going to do this, then you need to think about getting some work experience. And because my family were all teachers, actually, my mum and my dad and aunts and uncles and all sorts of people in, involved in teaching. Um, she handed me a copy of uh, what was called the Yellow Pages, which lots of your students will never have heard of. But it's a very big phone directory of all the local businesses. And I phoned up. Uh, the local independent radio station. I also phoned up BBC Radio Leicester and also the Leicester Mercury and got myself a, um, some work experience when I was doing my, so by the time I did my sort of O-levels GCSE, so I went and spent a day with each and really got bitten by the bug um, thoroughly by that stage. And then it happened uh, that when I was in my sixth form, um, I, I, the sixth form, uh, we were invited to put together a little programme for BBC Radio Leicester. And I sort of seized that opportunity with both hands. Um, and ended up uh, working on the Sunday morning programme with Leo Devine. So he's, he's, he's got a very big guiding hand in all of this. And so my dad used to drop me at Radio Leicester at the weekends. And bit by bit, they sort of let me loose on the equipment. I learned how to go out and do an interview and edit, which was then bits of tape, involved bits of tape and razor blades and sellotape. I mean, it was properly back in the arc, you know. Um, and so I just kept that going through my sixth form, kept, uh, went off to university to read English, 
really because I suppose my first toehold had been in radio, I sort of stayed with that, although I did a little bit of writing. Uh, worked at the local radio station when I was at, um, at university and then applied for the BBC's regional journalist training scheme uh, when just before I graduated and I was chosen as Midlands Today's uh, trainee uh, and back then you were trained in radio and TV together so you sort of did a couple of months in radio and a few months in telly and then if you're lucky you got a job at the end so that's what took me to Midlands Today at Pebble Mill in Birmingham which was a fantastic news patch. So that's, I mean, in a nutshell, that's how I got going. But it was sort of, you know, I got got in there early, kept, did, didn't take no for an answer, you know, and that sort of stood me in good stead right until today. You know, you just keep keep pushing at the door till it opens. I mean, it's, it's interesting to hear so many testimonies. The testimonies, is that the right word from people about how they got <laughs> this job? It always yeah. starts with a, a, a moment, a kind of bug that you've caught. And then work experience. I mean, it, we do go on about it at university and everywhere, really. It does come down to that pushing of doors, like you say, where, when you're young, when you can do things for free, uh, or at least you have time to do things. You know, that just seems to be the constant in all this. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's, not just, it's not just the work experience of working out how a newsroom works, but it's sort of building confidence and contact making and understanding that the quicker you're in there and the better your network is the earlier you know as early as possible it will always always stand you in good stead and the stuff you learn right in those formative years you will use all the way through you know still use it um you know I, I mean I was just having a chat with Tom before we came we went live here and you know the, the little bits and the people that you meet and the contacts that you make and just the you know, it's just having that muscle memory of phone bashing and chasing down contacts and researching and going back to people and keeping keeping people on your contacts file. You know, that matters from day one, even if you're sort of making the coffee at Radio Leicester like I was. You know, all of those contacts made a difference. Do, do people not... And when you're young and starting out, you get the impression sometimes that people don't return your calls, especially when you have to reveal that you're a student. <laughs> people well, don't do just, that now, do they? <laughs> well, I mean, the thing is, I, I, you know, I always think that there's a slight get out now because you can email people. You can email and you think, oh, I've sent them an email. That's that's enough. Like, you know, you need to email, then you need to follow up. And if they haven't, they haven't followed up, you know, I mean, ideally pick the phone up straight off, but very rarely people, you'll get through to the right person straight away. But, you know, it's it's just knowing to be persistent and that that's part of the job um, and knowing that actually most people will answer. They will pick the phone up. And actually, especially if you're a student, I think, you know, most of us are all very aware of the fact that, you know, we wouldn't be where we are now if people hadn't been kind enough to give us a, you know, a hand up. So, um, you know, I think always be optimistic that somebody will will answer and give you a hand. Excellent advice. I mean, so I, I'm assuming some of the questions that come will come from the students might be about advice. So I'm going to leave that alone a little yeah, bit um, sure. be a, and, and ask a question from an old person's point of view, which is, you know, we, we as educators and journalists, you know, one of our big kind of um, one of our biggest challenges to get people interested in the news in the way that I think we are mm. having presented news rounds. And it, I remember that from when I was in. I don't know if that was what got me into journalism, but it certainly helped. Do you, do you think there's more that the, the mainstream could do to kind of get younger people involved and interested in the news? Because as we said from COP26, it's not just news, it's actually stuff that's really important and affects them and will affect them. Well, I think, I think that's a really good question. And it's something that weighs very heavily on the minds of mainstream news programmes and mainstream news outfits like ours. Um, I mean, I have to say that, you know, I, I, I you know I've been very fortunate to work in some amazing places um, uh, over the 30 years that I've worked in news. But I'm so proud of the time that I worked at Newsround. And it was such an honour to do that job because you have the responsibility and that they still have that responsibility. But you have the responsibility of unpacking and explaining a, an increasingly complex world to a young audience um, and actually just from a journalistic skills point of view, that's really excellent because you're taking big, complex issues. I mean, back then it was things like, you know, the Northern Ireland peace process, stuff like that, really stuff that most, you know, most adults find challenging to get their heads around or to keep up with, you know. So you'd have, you'd always sort of make things very simple, or strip it back to the core and explain it to an audience. And, and those news services that are serving either children or, uh, you know, children and uh, teenagers and young adults have a really heavy responsibility to make sure 
that how you are presenting the, the news to them is relevant. And um, for example, our digital service now has a daily bulletin called The Rundown, which is, a, which is purely online. Uh, it's on uh, Instagram and all, all the other social media channels. But it's, it's a really sh tight, short little bulletin with the top stories. Um, all of our digital presenters are this sort of right age profile to be doing it, i.e. not my sort of age. Um, and, you know, the way it's written, the way it's packaged, the way it's presented is all aimed at, uh, you know, that audience and the way that they're used to consuming uh, content online. So, you know, it is a vital area. And frankly, it's the only way it's the only way for us to go if we want a future in this increasingly crowded news market. So I know that, you know, the BBC does, you know, has Newsround and has other equivalents. Sky have put a lot of energy into that. We certainly have at ITV and ITN more broadly. Um, and it, it couldn't be more important. Did you get, I mean, did you get, because obviously it is a, certainly the environment, COP26, there's so many of the issues that are coming out of it. It did feel like the, the younger people were engaging with that because it's a story that's going to really affect them. Did you get the feeling when you were there that these, you know, you, I'm sure you see the same people at these big events, just to get <laughs> feeling that these, these news, or these big news organisations are starting to, you know, repackage their content for this audience because they were right there. They were kind of ready to yeah. be informed on that. Yeah, they absolutely are. I mean, our, our, as I said, our digital service, they could have been, they could be following it on our, our digital service. You know, we have, and it's not just the rundown, which we have that's packaged, packaged for, for a younger audience, but even just everything that we offer, whether it's on Twitter, whether it's on Instagram, whether it's on Facebook, and we, you know, we are very, um, we're very platform aware now to make sure that we have, you know, you've got your core story, which we'll unpack um, and use our correspondents and experts and editors to work on for News at 10. But we've also got that expertise repackaged for different parts of our audience. Um, and, you know, you, you've got to do that. You've got to, do, you know, it's absolutely essential. If we want to hold on for as, to a broader range of audience as possible, there's, there's simply, you know, no, no other way forward. And I know certainly for COP26, that was, that was key. So you mentioned News Around, obviously, that's on BBC. Having worked for both, uh, one side and the other, as we used to call it. Um, what are the main sort of differences do you find in, in news, if, if that's not too unfair a question? Is there a kind of different agenda that you, you're aware of or how, what are the main differences, I guess? Uh, well, it, I, I mean, I've worked for the BBC, for Sky News and for ITV News. So I've got I'm quite a good, you know, all, almost equal lengths of time in each um, now. But um, I suppose the key difference, um, you know, <laughs> Apart from size, frankly, I mean, the, you know, the Beeb in the end has got a, a, an enormous sort of breadth and depth purely because of the enormous size of the organisation. Um, but that can also be um, cumbersome because they sometimes take longer to take decisions when covering stories. And certainly one of the things that I've come to appreciate over the years, both at Sky News and at ITV News, is that a smaller team can be more fleet of foot. Um, and you can get going, you can take decisions quicker um, and, uh, you know, frankly, get on the ground faster um, because you've got a, a, a sort of flatter structure for editorial decision making. Um, and I think that makes a difference in terms of the sort of energy that we have around uh, the news that we deliver to our audience. I think the, the key difference between, I've always thought between the, the BBC and ITV news is we have a very different approach in terms of presentation style. So, I mean, this isn't, this isn't to say that the BBC isn't warm and friendly because it is. And I know all the guys that work there and, you know, we all know each other. But um, I think ITV News has, you know, we are very deliberately, uh, ha we very deliberately have a, a sort of more relaxed, conversational, warmer style than our oppos at the BBC. Um, I think it grows very much out of the fact that ITV News is really connected to its audience at its regional roots. And the BBC would say the same, but there is a there is a distinction. The ITV regional news audience sort of holds their regional news programmes sort of very closely to their hearts. You know, it's funny. They've got this really, really very deeply embedded in their communities sort of relationship. And, and that and that actually informs the way we do our national news as well. We're just very conscious that if people opt to watch ITV news, they're, they're choosing a very different style of news. So we are, you know, that, you know, we, we try to bear that in mind that we, you know, we're conversational, we are sharing information, we're not handing it down. Um, and the key to ITV news and ITN uh, reporting has always been, you know, eyewitness as close to the, close to the events and the facts as possible. Um, 
And I don't know when that, whether any of you saw our, saw our coverage of the uh, storming of the US Capitol on January the 6th. I, I happened to be on that night. But, you know, Robert Moore and his team, you know, have been rightly, you know, showered with awards for the coverage that they get. He was right in there with the protesters in the crowd as they stormed the Capitol. He was in the building and witnessing it literally at the end of his nose. And, and it was sort of quintessential ITN ITV News eyewitness reporting. I'd say that was it in a nutshell. You know, we were absolutely in the thick of the action. Yeah, I mean, if you haven't seen that clip, you really should. Yeah, it's uh, extraordinary. It's extraordinary. Yeah. It teaches you, to, I mean, you could, you know, it's like a it's like a lesson in journal, ideal television news journalism, just in itself, just you can learn so much from just watching that footage. Yeah, that should be in a lecture. That's, co that's coming up, students. Uh, <laughs> that there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, you're, um, it's whatever it is now, half past three, uh, you're getting ready for News at 10. I guess one thing that we wouldn't know at all really um, from our point of view is, is what a day for you looks like. Uh, I know there is no such thing as a normal day, I'm sure, yeah, but yeah. generally, uh, how does it kind of begin and end for you? Uh, well, they're pretty, I mean, not, not just for me, but for the whole team, they're pretty, they're pretty long days, they're pretty full on. I mean, we have our first there's a big editorial meeting overseeing all of our bulletins at sort of nine in the morning. Obviously, we have a 24 hour operation uh, in terms of keeping across developing stories overnight, but everybody comes together at sort of nine, nine thirty to discuss the agenda of the day and how that might impact on each bulletin. Um, the whole point of News at 10 is that we're very aware that, um, you know, we are, you know, it's a privilege to go into people's sort of sitting rooms at 10 o'clock at night and our job is to make sense of the day. So in our lunchtime bulletin, for example, is literally sort of quite on the hoof. There's a lot of live breaking stuff because th things are getting going in the middle of the day. Evening news, you know, still quite often the case, especially in recent years at Westminster, et cetera. But News at 10's main aim is to do the sort of polished take on the day. So quite often we have, we commission quite a lot of extra material. Um, so I'm in touch with the uh, programme editor of the day just, just through email and phone calls in the morning. I might be in sort of late morning, early lunchtime-ish um, and check in to see how stores are, stories are developing. We're always exchanging ideas about who we should be chasing for interviews, what special treatment we can give a particular story, which correspondence ought to be assigned to that, whether, you know, I mean, is, is, is Robert Peston on tonight? What, what, what's his role tonight? And is Joel Hills, our business editor, you know, where is everybody? Can we get them on the, our, our best people on the best stories? Um, and it's a conversation that sort of just keeps going throughout the day. I mean, personally, I might also be working on a story for the programme. Um, I interviewed uh, uh, John Kerry last Friday from COP26. It was down the line. Um, so I had an awful lot of prep to do for that. There's a lot of logistics to sort out. You know, get, you can imagine just getting him in front of the right camera at the right time at COP26 and me in the studio and making sure that the studio is ready to rec pre-record it. Had a lot of prep to do for that. Um, and then our main editorial meeting is at five o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and we will, we by that stage, we're, we're pretty sure of the shape of the programme generally. Um, so we'll have a final meeting just to sign quite a lot of stuff off. Watch the 6.30 bulletin. Then we have another little huddle. I mean, I say huddle, of course, huddles are, you know, quite often done in virtual, you know, people working from home, which people still are. I mean, it's maddening that they still are, because it has to be. Um, we'll sort of ha have another little stock take at seven. And really then I work I always write the headline sequence that we call them the bombs on news at 10 traditionally so I will always write those so I'm co coordinating with the program editor trying to work out the best pictures the best little bits of um, you know sort bit of sound for the uh, for the headlines and I work very closely with the uh, lead writer on news at 10 because you know I, uh, Tom Bradby presents news at 10 uh, as, as well as me, obviously, um, and we have quite different voices, we have different ways of doing things, so we work closely with the lead writer in shaping the programme, and then it's simply a matter of being feet to foot in the evening, because quite often something new will come in, or something will change, um, and I can be writing stuff with the programme producer, or with the lead writer, I mean, in the middle of the bulletin, it can be happening, you know, whilst we're on a package, I'll be tip-tapping away, just finessing a, a, an intro into a piece, um, I go downstairs at about quarter past nine. Um, thankfully, our makeup artists are back, so I get a bit, quick bit of makeup on. Um, and then I'm usually in the studio for sort of half nine onwards, just so we're not rehearsing anything complicated if we've got a big graphic sequence to get to grips with. And then on air at 10, obviously. So it's pretty full on. 
it sounds full on. I've got so many questions as a result of that. But I can't <laughs> is, that, is that the buzz though? You still get that buzz, presumably. That's what makes you do it constantly. Yeah. To get out of bed every day to, to do this job. Yeah, I mean, and um, it, it's it's the two sides of a you know a coin that you're very fortunate to have in a way is that you can never quite let go of it. Um, you always you've always got your ear open or your eye open. Um, you can't ever quite switch off, which is one of the perils of this job. Um, but yes, the you know the flip side of that is is that you know you've always got something that's bugging you that you need to know more about. You need to find out more about. It's like a sort of a constant uh, itch that has to be scratched, doesn't it? News. <laughs> Well, yes. Um, and just as you know, you saying writing stuff up to the deadline again, that's the buzz. How close has it ever got to 10 o'clock where the lead story has had to change? Oh, really, really close. I mean, it's not necessarily the lead story. Um, two weeks ago, uh, 10 past 10, whilst we were on air, uh, the story broke that Her Majesty the Queen had in fact spent the night in hospital the previous night. Um, uh, and that broke at 10 past 10. By 20 past 10, we had our royal correspondent down the line from his camera at home on air. So literally in between seeing that drop on wires and running, uh, I think maybe two packages in between, um, we were frantically researching the story on the phone, getting Chris ship. Can you get in frame? He's trying to get a jacket on at home. And the poor guy actually had COVID at the same time. I and mean, he came up on screen, I thought, blimey, he doesn't look very well. I had no idea he'd actually got COVID. Um, so he'd literally scrambled and that all he got was the information that had dropped on wires. But obviously, because he's our royal editor, he can give us context. So that's how that's how late it can be. It doesn't have to be just before 10. It can be whilst you're on air, you know. And we, yeah, we've had lots of other stories break. I mean, I was here the night. And in fact, it's I, I've been thinking about it a lot recently. The, um, you know, the terrible uh, Paris terror attacks, the Bataclan attack, um, that all started... To, to come through at about nine o'clock on a Friday night um, and you know it was that classic and unfortunately we're also sort of not used to it because one should never be inured to it but it's that classic thing where it takes you a while to work out actually what is happening is it an explosion is it is does that mean it's terrorist if it where is it and of course we were getting reports from all around Paris because it was a multi-location attack um, so you go on air with with only the the first part of the picture and it starts to sort of fill in whilst you're on air um and that uh, that was one of the nights when the whole running order effectively got you know binned and we just sort of went with it um so yeah you've got to be on your toes and quite often there aren't very many people especially now there aren't very many people in here to to to, to you know to do it so it's properly full on those those things tend to happen when there's no one in I mean, yeah. my experience. <laughs> on the weekends, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, you mentioned there about becoming sort of inured to it. How do you kind of, how do you guard against that then as, as a journalist who's surrounded by, you know, a lot of news is, is bad. Um, how do you keep your kind of judgment, especially when the things are moving so fast? Is it just experience, do you think, or? I think that is, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, I'm very fortunate, to, you know, it's a real, it's a real honour to be asked to talk to young journalists actually. And, and it's something that, um, increasingly I've I've been thinking about uh, as, as as what you need as a toolkit as a junior journalist or reporter or whatever um, I think you do need to think about the impact on your mental health um, quite carefully and how you manage this job because when I started out there was no such thing as social media and not that you you know you were always listening out and reading the newspapers but that you know the, you, you could actually step back from the job a little when I started out um, whereas now it's it's full immersion if you want it I mean I don't need to you know, I clearly don't need to spell it out but you are just immersed in it the whole time so actually you have to have a strategy for stepping back um, you know and it is it's really difficult and uh, I don't get it right a lot of a lot of uh, experienced journalists will say that they really struggle with it and I think we've all struggled with it in the last 18 months in particular because We've just been steeped in this crisis, and that was and that was hot on the heels of Brexit, the 2019 general election. You know, before we even before we even got to COVID, a lot of newsrooms were exhausted because of the just the churn from Brexit. Um, and so it's something that I, you know I, I really um, you know I, I've been acutely aware, and and burnout in situations like that is a is a real danger, and I've seen it, and I've I've been pretty close to it myself. Um, so you have to have a strategy 
um, for stepping back, whether it's, you know, walking your dog like I was at seven o'clock this morning, just to get, clear my head before the day started or, you know, just think about it really carefully because it's not, it's, you know, it, it's not easy. No, I would certainly recommend all journalists get a dog for that precise. <laughs> so, well, or, or it's a you know, it's metaphorical equivalent. Something, yes. <laughs> do, do, do you find that there's there's because there's more awareness of it and people do talk about it now that the that, that newsrooms are more supportive generally? Definitely, definitely. Um and you know, um yeah, it's it's something that gets spoken about a lot. Um, you know, just even just, even just from the sort of HR point of view, there's we know that, that there is support available. Um, for when things get tricky but but at the same time you know it's it you know when you go through a period of intense you know intense work in a newsroom it, you know you can't avoid the intensity of it there's not there's no there's no way of sidestepping it you have to that's why you need to know that when you come into this job um you know there are sacrifices that you you make and actually more importantly to mention there are a lot of sacrifices that your family make um you know uh, you know i remember in 2004 when I just had my, uh, so my my first son was born in 2003, um, and uh, 2004, uh, the Boxing Day tsunami hit, and I was working at Sky News then, and uh, we just, so I was a relatively new mother, so son was just coming up to nearly two, and uh, the Boxing Day tsunami hit, and I just basically got told to get to the airport, clear off, you know, you're off to Thailand I literally I mean it was literally handing my husband the baby and not knowing when I was coming back um and uh, so you need you know you need your partners friends families uh a lot to get through doing this job sometimes and it's it's worth mentioning because they they have to put up with quite a lot with it <laughs> um well yeah I mean that's that's the unknowns about the job as again as part of the buzz unfortunately it is it is part of the buzz but it's it's all you know i mean i i one of my you know i was very fortunate when i worked at sky news to work for a wonderful man called nick pollard who will be very well known to the rts because he he works for them now but he was head of sky news and uh he always used to at the end of the year there'd be you know he was very wonderful in doing sort of christmas parties and thank yous and uh, he always used to invite uh, people's partners along to these lunches and he would make it his business every year to thank the wives husbands girlfriends boyfriends whatever thank them for supporting the newsroom because it wouldn't happen if there wasn't somebody holding for back at base quite often so i, I always thought that was a really lovely thing to do yeah Right, well, look, that's enough from me, I think. Uh, I've got some papers to shuffle. I'm going to uh, sidestep now and let uh, Tom take over. There's some questions coming in. Uh, if you have any questions, please just put them in the Q&A. And Tom is now going to pose them to Julie. So hello, Tom. Hello, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, Hi, Tom. Hello, Julie. Hi, uh, Tom. Just a little reminder for the, um, I'll reintroduce myself to the participants. I'm Tom Cross, a third year journalist at Plymouth Marjon University. Um, we've had a couple of questions come in. Um, I'll start with Anna's. Uh, she asks, how much would you say early career journalists need to push themselves out of their comfort zone? Any tips for making this less scary? <laughs> I'd say as much as possible. Um, and I suspect you won't be too surprised to hear me say that. Um, I think one of the key things, never let the fear or lack of confidence hold you back because there will always be somebody that will push. So you need to push and you need to be courageous and you need to be not afraid of failure because you will get pushbacks. You will get times when the story doesn't quite work or something goes wrong or, you know, it could be a whole host, a whole catalog of things can go wrong. Um, but unless you push yourself out of your comfort zone, how will you ever know what your potential is? You know, you, yes, you might hit a brick wall again and again and again. You think, well, maybe that's my, not my natural territory, you know, but you won't know unless you've tried. So um, I just think that, you know, especially at this stage, why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? You know, you've got if you if you've made a little break into this business, you know, you have got to max it out to the absolute limits. You know, talk to everyone. Don't be afraid of talking to anybody, you know, and actually the more used you get to not being afraid of talking to anybody or not being afraid of picking the phone and ringing anybody, um, you know, you the you know if you don't do that, you you won't really learn how to do the job properly either, because you've got to be afraid for the door to be quite often slammed in your face. But 
you know, you might get that door slammed in your face nine times out of 10, but the door, the one time it gets opened could be your absolute scoop, best moment, best contact you ever made, could be your leaping pad onto the next part of your career. So literally don't hold back. Um, I think it's true to say in my experience that, you know, uh, young women are, you know, are, are sometimes less likely to push as hard as their male colleagues. I have seen this. This is, you know, um, for goodness sake, just don't ever hold back. I mean, I'm not saying be crazy or take unnecessary risks, but I'm saying if you don't stretch yourself, you'll never understand what your potential is. So just hey. hold back. It's just it's a waste of your life to hold back. Yeah, um, a lot uh, to do with that question. Sorry, my iPad just came up on the call there. I <laughs> Following on from that, uh, being outside of your comfort zone, there's been a lot of times that obviously you've been outside your uh, comfort zone. I assume I would be. Yeah, yeah. Um, this could be the big events like covering Prince Philip's funeral this year, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, going back to leading and chairing uh, leaders. Uh, <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, what one of those do you think was the most influential for you? Uh, uh... Any events or, or moment? across your career do you think uh, well I, I mean if we're talking about it just just to sort of nod back to that previous question which I think is a really good one because I think it's a really good thing to discuss and sort of uh, and and face up to because you know you can you, I'm not saying don't bluff knowledge don't bluff stuff you don't actually know but you can bluff confidence even if you're not feeling it you know um I mean quite the most challenging terrifying um job that I've done in this uh, in, in my uh, career has been doing the leaders debates without question uh, and the first one that I did was in 2015 um, and because of the way these uh, debates are uh, decided upon and how they work um, you know quite often we don't know until quite late whether they're actually happening whether the parties will agree whether they'll actually put their leaders up or they want to send somebody else it's just so you're sort of for an event that you're not necessarily you don't necessarily know who the participants are and suddenly in 2015 David Cameron said well I'll come and do one but you need to get all the other party leaders so not just Labour and the Lib Dems but you know SNP and, and all the rest including UKIP because we had Nigel Farage there as well and you know we had the leader of the Greens we had leader of Plaid Cymru etc etc so suddenly I'd gone from contemplating a, a debate with three contenders to seven and um, I mean, I, you know, countless sleepless nights trying to prep that because you've got to be across all of the different manifestos, all the different particular political characters. You've got to understand the nuance and the, the sort of pinch points of where they will, you know, get the debate going between all of them. And, and it, it had never been done before to have seven party leaders on the stage. So it was that sort of fear of it never actually having done. And I mean, it was it was quite frankly, utterly, utterly terrifying. And I've done quite a lot of them since and they never lose the terror factor. They are absolutely hold onto the furniture, nearly pass out with nerves, terrifying. <laughs> I mean, really, they. and when they're finished, I'm sort of good for absolutely nothing for about a week afterwards. They just, you know, the adrenaline is off the scale. And the only, the only comfort that you can take is that the politicians feel even worse about it than you do. <laughs> I suppose a good follow-up to that would be <laughs> who was the hardest prime minister to interview? Uh, <laughs> that's a very good question. Uh, the hardest prime minister to interview? Well, um, it, you know, they're all they're all challenging in their own way. I mean, I obviously had um, my moment with Theresa May where when I'd asked her, uh, you know, her the naughty question, and I had the fields of wheat moment, um, and that was one of those moments where. Um, I mean, I say that they they have they're, they're difficult for different characters. And one of the things that was was challenging with Mrs. May was that she's naturally an incredibly private person. You know, she's sort of an introvert in a world of extroverts at Westminster. So, but I thought that's what made her so intriguing in a way. And when I do the big interviews for, we do these uh, profile pieces on party leaders for the Tonight programme. So I get a good half, you know, it's a half hour programme. We do a very long interview with them. So you've got to do all the detailed policy stuff. You've got to do the manifesto stuff. But what we always do with those interviews is have a little section where we, we try and reveal a bit more about the person. And, and I was trying, you know, it was just hard with Mrs. May because she's so private and she's so reticent to talk about herself. So, the, so when we had the sort of fields of wee moment, 
Um, I think that's why it went so why it went so sort of crazy, you know, because suddenly she'd, she'd answered something in this quite a, quite an amusing way. Um, and uh, you know, I had no idea that, that would take off in the way that it was. But she was she was challenging to interview because she's so private. You know, there are other there are other prime ministers that are difficult. I mean, it was very difficult to interview Gordon Brown because he would just he could just motor with you know real of statistics and facts, and it would just keep coming and keep coming and keep coming, and you'd try and get in with a within a question, and it was just like it was really really hard to interview him, even though. You could have had a conversation with him five minutes before that would have been very chatty, very personable. And you thought, gosh, this is going to be quite a different sort of interview. But literally, as soon as the camera came on, it was like this sort of, you know, this juggernaut of stats would come at you and it would it would be quite challenging to try and get in there. You know, so he was he was tough. Got a couple more questions come through. Uh, one of them is the path that you took do you think there is a, a set path into journalism to get far or do you think there's lots of different routes that you can take uh, oh, to get to the very top that's a really good question there are so many different routes and that's what makes newsrooms and uh, when they're working properly that's what makes them good because you know there will people who will come in through specialist routes that might have worked in you know you know um who've been trained in medicine for example who become science correspondents or who might have worked in business and come in and do an economics brief or whatever um you know the the, the more routes people take into the newsroom the better the newsroom will be because you want to draw on people's backgrounds their expertise you know stories or places or countries or cultures that's why it's so so vital that you have diversity in newsrooms, you know, otherwise you are not holding that mirror properly back up to society. You're not reflecting the right uh, range of voices and opinions. Um, so, you know, thank heavens there isn't a set route into journalism and nor should there be, otherwise newsrooms aren't functioning properly. I mean, don't get me wrong, courses like yours are fantastic because they give you a really good toolkit. Quite often they will give you opportunities for work experience and attachments and all the rest of it. Um, but, you know, they're not, they're not essential. You know, some of our best journalists, I mean, our US correspondent, Emma Murphy, um, who's a very good friend of mine, didn't go to university. She got in because she worked on the campaign to bring um, uh, John McCarthy, the hostage in Lebanon home. She got involved with that campaign, then got herself, because she was involved in that, she got a little job on a local newspaper and then got into news that way. People come in from you know, so many interesting routes and that's what makes uh, newsrooms great places to be. We uh, spoke about earlier uh, about some of the prime ministers that you've interviewed and which ones then were uh, hard. Yeah. We've had a question in the uh, Q&A about how would you tackle difficult interviewees? Are there any more that were quite difficult and any tips on how to uh, get through those difficult interviews? Um, well, uh, well, yeah, I'm trying to think. Oh, God, that was so many tricksy ones. Um, it depends on the nature of the interview, interview to be honest, because sometimes an interview can be very quick on the hoof. You might be doorstepping somebody where you've got to literally, you've got to know the key question. It might be just one question that you've got to throw at somebody in a crowd. You know, so you, it's like distilling a whole moment into one question. So that is quite an art in itself. If you've got half an hour to interview, you know you can go over a range of subjects so you need to literally map it out i mean when i was doing john kerry last week for example that interview was on off on off for two weeks so every single time they said oh, we might do it tomorrow i didn't have to go back to scratch but i had to chart out that interview uh, on the basis of what happened in the previous sort of 12 hours at cop to make sure i got all the facts straight I mean, the, the, there's just no way of avoiding it. You just have to do your homework, you know, and, and the, the better prepared you are, the more prepared you are. If things go off track or if they suddenly say something that doesn't tally with something they said three months ago, you know, you'll kick yourself if you're not aware of it. So it's sort of, I mean, as, as in so much of life, sort of 90% preparation, 10% execution, you know, um, you, there's no substitute for doing the homework. But also, I, I also think a, a really good starting point is just understanding who your audience are and what they want to know. You are in a really privileged position because you're there on their behalf. So there's no point in asking some, you know, what you might perceive to be a super, you know, I've got them on this very tiny little key point that's very down in the weeds of an issue. If, it's not, if that's not relevant to your audience, if they won't care about it, if it's not actually getting the answers that they need, then it's, it's a waste of energy, really. Um, so know your audience, do your prep, 
and then have confidence to be fleet of foot. And, and the crucial thing is just, you know, listen, 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 in case they lob something in that you have to pick up and be, you know, reactive to and change the whole interview if necessary. Talking a lot about difficult interviews and interviewees, um, you work a lot with live TV and obviously that can cause its fair share of errors and yeah. mistakes. Uh, question in the chat there was how would you recover or sort of get past those mistakes <laughs> well I've made plenty and let's let's I've made a lot um but <laughs> I don't know I think in the end um I mean listen what's crucial is that if you've made a factual error which happens in live broadcasting if you've made a factual error clearly your first responsibility is to correct that as fast as humanly possible um, uh, that that is, you know, sort of base camp, you know, without question, that is first responsibility. You know, I mean, the bottom line is, is that, you know, people do understand that mistakes happen in live broadcasting. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of churn. It can be things can blow up very quickly on social media. Everybody can have a view on it. They can absolutely take you apart for it. Um, but it is a live, you know, news is a live environment and we are all just human. Um, you know, so <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, I just, it, it, you've just, you know, the bottom, it, bottom line is you just get on with the job and do it to your sometimes, hopefully most of the times things go well, they don't always go well, but you've just got to have the confidence to get back in there and, and crack on, you know, we are, we're not sort of robots, we are human, that mistakes happen, and I think that because of social media is so unforgiving, it's so unbelievably unforgiving, that, you know, I think that, you know, it has become a lot harder, but in the end, you've just got to, you know, have the courage of your, you know, convictions and get on with your job. Um, I'd like to wheel back the clock a little bit here um, to about 11 years ago, uh, RTS winner 2010. Um, yeah. You were the first woman to win that award. Now looking forward to 2021. How influential do you think that was? What does that award mean to you now? Oh, goodness. Um, well, it, it was a huge honour to be given it. It was, it was an incredible honour to be given that award. Um, and I suppose that, you know, saying you were the first woman, it feels a bit sort of old fashioned now to even say it, doesn't it? Um, but when I came into, when I joined the BBC as a news trainee, um, each region selected a trainee and I was the only woman that year. So I was on a course with um, six other blokes um, and that would simply never, ever happen now. You know, it just wouldn't happen that you go into a, a room full of that year's intake of BBC trainees and there's only one woman. I mean, it just wouldn't happen. Um, so things have changed enormously for women in news uh, in the 30 years that I've worked in it. Um, it it's not perfect by any means, um, particularly when we're talking about the treatment of women on social media and the pressure that it is brought to bear on a lot of female journalists. And I'm not saying, I mean, I, you know, I, I get, I get a, a share of it, but nothing like uh, you know, female colleagues like Laura Koonsberg and the political, you know, Beth Rigby, the female political senior correspondents get a terrible time online. Um, so it's not, it's a long way from being perfect, but just in terms of, you know, boots on the ground, there are a lot more of us and there are a lot more of us in management. I mean, at, at ITN, for example, ITN produces Channel 4 News, Channel 5 News and ITV News. Well, our uh, CEO is a woman um, the editor of ITV News is a woman. The editor of News at 10, the main programme editor of News at 10 is a woman. You know, and that, you know, when I came into the room, we were pretty well outnumbered and that's just not the case now. So it, things have moved on and it is, it just seems to be, it feels a bit archaic to say first woman to win stuff. You know, I mean, it's, you know, I was sort of on a Tuesday or whatever, you know, it, it, wouldn't, make, it wouldn't make any difference now because people, you know, people rightly get recognised from, you know, all, all elements of the industry and all walks of life um uh, but yeah it was a, it was a huge huge honor it was a huge honor mike uh, asked or started it a little earlier left it of course uh, <laughs> student to ask um it's the advice section uh, what do you advice would you give say to a student now and do you think that's differed and say when you started uh, your path to to where you are now Absolutely, because you have got um, there are it, it's it's a sort of it's a really tricky one this, but but you've got so many more opportunities to try out your journalism because of what social media offers you and the opportunities that you've got now. You can, 
you know, I mean, clearly everybody needs meaningful work experience. You've got to push for that. You've really got to push to, to being in a professional journalistic um, outfit that will give you an insight, support, and hopefully, a, a, you know, a leg up into the industry. Um, but you've got so many ways that you can try things out now. You can blog, you can host a podcast, you can write. I mean, if you're in college, there's almost certainly, you know, college uh, newspapers that you can write for there's a ho- I mean literally there's anywhere you look there are opportunities for you to tell stories and tell stories in your own way there are brilliant opportunities to specialize you can you know start if you're interested in Plymouth Argyle which I know you've done some stuff with Green um, Army <laughs> yeah, absolutely yeah you're starting to a Leicester City girl here um, but you can um uh, you know, there you know there are fan sites that you can write for anything. Just get writing, get engaging, and, and crucially, start making contacts. You know, it's not just about the storytelling. It's like how you build your little network and people that you go back to time and time and time again. You know, I mean, I worked at Radio Leicester, Radio Shropshire, Midlands Today. You know, I've got people that I'm still in touch with and could call on, or if I needed a bit of expertise on something in that area, I know where I go to. Um, Nina Nana, our arts editor here at ITV News, she's you know the best arts editor in the whole of the media landscape, in my view. She and I were trainees at Midlands Today together, and she's just through there in the newsroom, and we still work together. Um, you know, your little network will count for the whole of your career. So that's why, you know, again, to go back to the thing about push, 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 get your network up and running. It'll matter even now, you know, even stuff that you do now will matter later on. Um, I'd like to sort of like not make it so uh, like, oh, what's the biggest error or whatever. I'd uh-huh. like to sort of make a nice sort of one here. Um, who's been your favourite interviewee? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, I've had... <laughs> I've got some sort of favourite, you know, I don't know. It's really funny. And you get that question in sort of all sorts of different guises. I mean, look, I'm, you're t- looking at somebody who's interviewed Kermit the Frog, for goodness sake, with somebody lying on their ground with his hand up his whatever. Um, but um, favourite interviewee, um, I loved interviewing Hillary Clinton when she brought her first, first, first bo- volume of her autobiography out. And it was sort of just after the Clinton years and incredible to sit down with her and, and just talk to her about how she navigated, you know, all of the scandals around Bill Clinton. That was absolutely incredible. And just to be, you know, going into that world of an entourage around a former first lady was really sort of thrilling. Um, You know, I interviewed uh, Princes William and Harry in Lesotho um, in 2010 when it was the World Cup and they went out uh, to South Africa and it was before things fell apart between them and we were up a mountainside and um, you know, it was obviously before Prince William's marriage and all the rest of it. And we just did a, pr- a whole program about the brother princes. And it was it was incredible to just sort of sit with them halfway up a mountainside and just talk about William becoming king one day and how that would affect Harry and how Harry was planning to support his brother and all the rest of it. And, you know, you sort of look at what's happened since and it's sort of heartbreaking, you know, but that was that was a really extraordinary thing. Um, I doorstepped Pope Francis at the Vatican <laughs> and managed to pull that one off. That was quite that was quite hilarious and got the BBC hopping mad that I'd scooped them, even though they had a Rome correspondent that had a sort of professional satisfaction in it. Um, but lots, you know, I mean, I <laughs> tried to interview Simon Le Bon of Duran Duran once and I was so flummoxed because I'd been such a teenage fan. That I couldn't actually get a sentence out. I made a complete fool of myself. So, you know, you, you know, I suppose the thing is, is that, you know, they all have their own particular attraction and, and happy memories. Um, and I've been just really very, very fortunate to be in a position to do them. You know. Like all these stories, I guess, I, so I don't know how long this answer will be, whether it'd be quite long or quite short. Um, why journalism? Why did you decide to go through this path, not be um, something else, really? Well, yeah, I, I just think it was, um, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's too strong a word to use the word vocation but I just sort of loved the idea of of storytelling and finding and just I'm just nosy and just wanted to meet you know you know I just loved the fact and you know I still remember to this day um you know what it meant to me and what it felt like when I was at Radio Leicester with Leo Devine um, and, you know, he'll remember me sort of trotting in and out there as a school chick, you know, I mean, I was still at school, you know, 
Um, and I just remember the day when somebody said to me at Radio Leicester, oh, I really need some Vox Pops for this package that I'm doing. And back then you had a big bit of recording equipment called a Ewer um, with a microphone on a long lead. And it was a big heavy tape machine. Um, and I just remember, because Radio Leicester used to be up in a sort of tower block <laughs> called Epic House. And um, coming down in the lift with this, you know, tape recorder on my shoulder and a microphone in my hand and thinking, this is just, just like the best thing ever. And I can go out onto the streets of Leicester and just go up to people and talk to them and find out what they're thinking and get under the skin of something and really start to just, you know, just news gather, you know, and get people's opinion. And I don't know, I, I can't even remember what the story was, but I managed to, I thought, well, I'll just go up to near where the mayor's got his office and just hang around there in the little square in front of there. And I don't know how I managed to do it, but I blagged my way in to get an interview with the mayor. It was like, you know, this is... And um, really, really very pleased with myself, found myself, I thought, how have I got in here? And it's just because I just had the cheek to ask, you know, and, and came back to, to Radio Leicester. And then, uh, then you had to edit it all together. And I remember sort of sitting there with bits of the interview. You literally cut out sections of the interview on bits of tape and lay them out and then edit them, stick them together in order. And I just think, God, this is just the best thing ever, you know. And I, and, and I still get that, you know, there's a lot of, with television news, there's a lot of logistics and you're always sort of thinking, oh, have we got the camera crew? I've got the crew that I want. Are they there on time? We've got parking. How long have we got? When are they going to be here? But actually, when you sit down and you are just in that moment, in that deep, concentrated conversation that you get with an interview, you know, there's sort of nothing like it. There's sort of nothing like it. And that's where I still get the buzz, you know, is that deep, you know, connected, challenging conversation that you have as part of an interview. Um, and I think that fundamentally, you know, it doesn't matter at what level you're doing this job, but the, the buzz is sort of the still, still the same, you know? And, I, and funnily enough, I was talking to some, uh, somebody this morning over coffee, a chap who works at Bloomberg. He's been a journalist for 20 years there. And we, we both said the same thing, you know, that actually that, that bit of the job hasn't changed. You just do it at different levels and to different degrees. Um, I'm aware that uh, time is quickly running out. I'll ask one more question from the audience. Um, it's how do you deal with remaining politically neutral and uh, in an argument which you may not personally agree with? Uh, I presume that means on air, um, but I'm pretty, care I'm pretty careful off air as well, actually, um, because if you're a broadcast journalist in this, this country, you know, you've obviously got a duty to impartiality. I mean, look, I mean, politics has been feverish and it has been, you know, polarised and divisive. Um, and, you know, a lot of us have quite, you know, that every, because you're engaged with politics on a daily basis, we've all got our set of views, but you have to leave them at the door. You know, we're there as 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 neutral, you know, neutral, impartial observers. I mean, that's not to say that you don't unpack a story properly and hold all elements of it up to the light. Um, but at the same time, it's it's not for me to impose my views on on the viewers, because our viewers are there from a whole host and range of perspectives. So our job is to 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 be that neutral standpoint when we're delivering the news. It's not always easy. And sometimes you do have to bite your lip or put a pen in your leg or whatever <laughs> when you feel strongly about something. Um, but, it, you know, you are you are duty bound to do it. You know, that's why audiences, you know, trust ITV news. It's trusted impartial news. And it does. Again, it's live news. It doesn't always work. But, you know, that is our absolute driving mission. Thank you very much, Julie. Um, I'll pass Pleasure. back over to Mike. Um, but thank you very much. Pleasure. Really good to talk to you. Thank you for the questions. It's no problem. Yeah, well done, Tom. Uh, you must have good teachers. Um, <laughs> indeed, <laughs> yeah, indeed. I'm very aware that um, time is running out. I, I've just got two things I, I thought I'd ask on the back of that, and then one silly question. Um, so, where do you where do you think then you're about to present news at ten? Where do you think television news futures lie? I mean, that's an awful question to ask right at the end. But where do you, where do you see it going? Because obviously, it's changed a lot. Audience have, have fragmented mm -hmm. so many different platforms now. What do you what do you think TV's got in store for the future in terms of news? 
Well, we're always adapting and thinking really hard about how we deliver news. Um, we've still got a really substantial audience for um, appointment to view bulletins, um, you know, particularly in the pandemic, the sizes of our audiences, you know, for all the very obvious reasons were, were some of the highest we've seen in, you know, a very long time. Um, but, you know, we're, you know, to go back to what I was saying earlier, we're very aware that the audience that tunes in for News at 10 is not the audience, well, not even the, the you know, your, the, your, the age of your students, you know, a lot of them are older, they'll be sort of over 45. Um, and have been used to consuming a daily news bulletin. Um, you know, it is down to us to adapt and change, um, to think about how we're covering stories, to make them more fleet of foot. You know, the technology has made things better for us. You know, you know, the, just the fact that during the pandemic we've we've turned to Zoom for interviews, that, that will now become a regular feature. It means we can get to, to more people it more easily. Um, but uh, you know, we uh, you know to, to go back to what we were talking about, how we package our news digitally um, that is the essential and has to be the way forward and you know Sky News it was interesting reading that art interview with Adam Bolton earlier this week he, he's he recognizes a lot of change in the air and the, and the future is is digital you know so I think I think there's there's a lot of life in the appointment to view uh, television uh, bulletins uh, for, for some time yet um, but but we all have to be aware that things are evolving and that's why parts of our newsroom, the whole of our newsroom is adapting, but we have a sort of corner of it, which is digital, which is absolutely driving that change. And we all have to get our heads around that. Yeah, all of us, us too. Yeah. Um, excellent. Well, great. And then uh, one last one then. So just before you answer this, bear in mind that the last person we had uh, on one of these sessions it is now still on Strictly Come Dancing and also started at Radio Leicester. Um, Who's that then? I'm trying to think who it is. Dan, Dan Walker. Oh, goodness. Did um, he start at Radio Leicester? I had no idea. How interesting. I don't it, think it, it was is... Leicester. I don't think it was Leicester, Mike. It was oh, no. Sorry. I think it was. Anyway, regards to that. Um, what next for you, Julie? What's, what, what are you, what are you going to do? You host a podcast now. Um, <laughs> what, what's What's left in your career do you think was left thanks <laughs> no, i didn't mean it like that you know. <laughs> yeah, how long Lots. are you going to keep thrashing on <laughs> i don't know i think the answer is very few of us know really but i you know um we've <laughs> there's there's always the next big event to be prepping for there's always the next big story to be prepping for i'm you know i'm very very happy doing what i'm doing at the moment and um uh, you know as long as people will have me doing it i'm i'm super content but you know you never know in this in this uh, uh uh in this industry i mean actually all of my big job moves have just come you know out of the blue i didn't plan any of it particularly i've just been very fortunate to have opportunities present themselves um you know i'm always trying to find new ways of doing this job so you know which is why i had my own podcast and i try all sorts of different things um, I think we just got to have keep our minds open and our eyes open. But I think there's that you know that there's there's a pretty pretty long way to go for bulletins like News at Ten yet. I wasn't for a moment suggesting that. You were <laughs> <on> that uh, <laughs> what a brilliant question to end on. <laughs> okay, so I'm hoping that Boris Johnson's given you lots of ammunition to go out on tonight's uh, News at Ten. Probably has. Um, I'm still, he's still going. I'm just watching the corner going. of my well, room. So, and, and I know we'll all be watching tonight. So your know, audience figures will go up slightly. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, just to say really thanks ever so much for, for joining us. It's been really fascinating um, hearing about your career and also the excellent advice for the students, which is always really nice to hear. Well, it's a, it's a great pleasure. Thank you very much um, indeed for asking me on. Uh, thank you to Leo for extending the initial invitation. And, you know, uh, thank you for all the lovely questions. I just wish you all the best and just go out there with, you know, great courage and optimism. You know, somebody's got to get that job. Why shouldn't it be you? Great advice. Thanks so much, Jilly. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Good luck with the rest of the course. Cheers. Thank bye. you. Bye-bye.